Hey, Paul, I'm excited to tell you that we are launching a Curbsiders Patreon. Have you heard about this? I I did because I work with you, but tell me more about it. (laughs) All right, Paul. Well, we want to be able to keep offering this great free content, and we're doing things like upgrading our website. We offer transcripts now for episodes, recording new seasons of our miniseries, Teach and Addiction Medicine. The Digest is growing its staff. And Paul, now we're on video. People can see us uh, as we're talking right here. What a treat for our listeners. That's right. So with Cashlack admitting privileges, they're going to get all episodes ad free that's the whole back catalog plus future episodes and twice monthly there's gonna be bonus episodes where me and you recap a show and answer some listener questions so people should sign up today at patreon.com slash curbsiders and uh, you get a whole lot more of paul america's pcp The Curbsiders Addiction Medicine is for entertainment, education, and information purposes only. The topics discussed should not be used to diagnose, treat, or prevent any diseases or conditions. Furthermore, the views and statements expressed on this podcast are solely those of the hosts and should not be interpreted to reflect official policy or position of any entity aside from possibly Cashlack Memorial Hospital. In short, we aren't responsible if you screw up. Please do your homework and let us know if we got something wrong. Natalie, how are you doing tonight? I'm doing pretty good. It's it's a rainy day here, but it was okay. I stayed warm inside my house. How are you? I'm doing pretty well. I know Natalie from Fellowship that when it gets cold, you like to put the little feet warmers in. Is that is it that time of year yet? I think that I am finally past the using my toe warmers, my skiing toe warmers in daily life part of the type of part of the year. I finally moved on from that, but that is right. I do I do do that. Yes, I'm a very cold oriented person. Yes, but but your heart is so big and warm. Welcome back to the Curbsiders Addiction Medicine, our series on substance use disorders. I'm Dr. Carolyn Chan, and today I have Dr. Natalie Stahl with me. And today we're excited to discuss opioid overdose response with Dr. Alex Wally. But before we get too much into our conversation, Natalie, will you just give us a reminder of what we do, what we talk about on the show? Sure, Carolyn. So we are the Addiction Medicine Podcast. It uses expert interviews to demystify common addiction medicine topics and reduce stigma and also inspire listeners to be fierce advocates for all individuals who use substances. A reminder that most episodes are available for free CME credit. That's through VCU Health CE for all health professionals. That's at curbsiders.vcuhealth.org. All you have to do is create an account. And by listening to this episode and completing the CME questions, this can be used to count towards the new DEA eight-hour requirement on substance use disorder education. So that's pretty cool. It's very cool, Natalie. So be sure to do that. And special thanks, as always, to the American College of Academic Addiction Medicine, also known as ACAM, who have partnered with us to help support this mini series. ACAM is the proud home for academic addiction medicine faculty and trainees, and they're absolutely dedicated to training and supporting the next generation of academic addiction medicine leaders. Whether you're an addiction med physician preparing for the board exam or a doc in practice looking to learn more about addiction medicine, ACAM offers several self study products that can help meet your needs. Their professional practice bundle includes access to 86 self-assessment modules that provide CME, as well as 46 didactic lecture recordings. ACAM's board prep bundle also offers access to the 46 didactic lecture recordings, along with a nearly 200 item question bank and its addiction e-practice tests. So to learn more about these and other product offerings, as well as memberships opportunities, be sure to check out ACAM.org. So we have a fantastic conversation today with our guest, um, Dr. Alexander Wally. He's a professor of medicine at Boston University School of Medicine. He's a primary care physician and addiction um, medicine specialist at Boston Medical Center. And he focuses on the medical complications of substance use, specifically HIV and overdose. He's developed an inpatient addiction consult service and a low barrier walk-in addiction clinic. He's a founding director of the Graykin Addiction Medicine Fellowship. And he's also the president-elect of the American College of Academic Medicine, Academic Addiction Medicine. He serves as the medical director of the Boston Department of Public Health Bureau on Substance Addiction Services and um, the Overdose Prevention Program. And that has trained and equipped over 100,000 people in Massachusetts communities with naloxone rescue kits, including people at risk for overdose and their social networks. So today he's going to teach us um, 
about how to counsel patients on avoiding overdose and responding to overdose. He's going to tell us about the importance of focusing on respiratory rate and oxygenation and not just on if they're awake or not. And he's going to give us some tips on how, say, in the hospital, you might um, monitor patients who might have had an overdose and respond and titrate naloxone in the hospital setting. So without uh, further ado, let's get to it. Hi, Alex. We're really excited to have you today. And we just want to get to know you a little bit better by asking a couple of rapid fire questions. So can you give us a one-liner to describe yourself? Sure, Carolyn. Um, I'm a 52-year-old HIV primary care provider, addiction consult attending, overdose prevention researcher and enthusiast, a fan of addiction medicine as a subspecialty. I'm a husband and a father of two young men in college and a former college water polo player. That's so many hats. It's a lot of fun. <laughs> I'm really excited to be here, by the way. We're excited to have you. Do you still play any water polo? Uh, not since my 30s when I got a black eye and showed up in clinic the next day and thought maybe I should switch to tennis. I have a sibling who played water polo in high school, and I always was impressed by the intensity of the matches. It seems like an intense game. <laughs> um, can you tell us a little bit about what your favorite aspects of working in addiction medicine are? What keeps you doing this work? Uh, well, those of us in addiction medicine are a really friendly group. Um, we take our work seriously because it is serious. It's life and death for many people. Um, but I... Um, I'm really taken by the stories of my patients, the stories of um, them getting better and uh, the courage they have to face uh, the adversity that they have. Um, it's really humbling because um, while treatment works and we have harm reduction that offers a lot of hope these days, um, you never know with any individual what the future holds. Uh, sometimes it's really um, uh, rewarding and hopeful, and other times things don't turn out so well. So um, that's why it's humbling, but uh, it's worth it, and you get to see people get better every day. So let's jump into a case, and um, we'll have some questions for you. So Great. Mr. D is... Um, uh, Mr. D is a 28-year-old man um, who, with opioid use disorder who was found unconscious and responses by his friend Jay, who is your patient, um, in his apartment. Um, and he'd been reportedly been injecting fentanyl. Jay called 911 and used naloxone and waited until EMS arrived. And he comes to your office today after witnessing this overdose. And he wants more information on what to do um, if someone is overdosing, if he should have done anything differently. He also has an OUD. And he is always worried that he could go to jail if he's caught with drugs or paraphernalia on him if he calls 911 to respond to an overdose. Um, so just to start, can you give us a big picture view of the history and the status of the public health crisis of opioid overdoses in the U.S.? Uh, sure. So um, uh, opioid overdose is now the leading cause of preventable accidental uh, injury death. Um, it's... Uh, exceeded the the number of uh, motor vehicle traffic accidents, um, which actually are have been going down because of safer cars and safer roads, uh, and uh, also the number of firearm deaths, which have been going up, uh, as I think we all hear in the news. But but overdose deaths far exceed both of those um, causes of accidental injury to death and. Um, that's really been in the that's really been the case for a while, even before fentanyl uh, came around in 2013. I think it's around 2008, 2010, when that was the case, and that was sort of at the um, that was 10 years after o opioid overdose deaths were driving um, overdose deaths or poisoning deaths higher and higher each year through the 2000s. And many people attribute that to the so-called first wave. Um, which was driven by prescription opioids. Uh, and then there was a second wave from, I don't know, 2009 to 2013 that was driven by increasing heroin-related deaths. And then since 2013, it's really been 
um, fentanyl, which uh, is always, almost always when it causes an overdose, illicitly manufactured fentanyl. So not the fentanyl that we prescribe in the hospital or for chronic pain, but, but fentanyl that's been introduced into the drug supply. Um, and a lot of people are talking about a fourth wave right now, which is, um, I think, been there all along. But the elements of that include um, multi-substance or poly-substance overdose, which which really has been the rule rather than the exception. I mean, opioids are kind of the most important substance that drives overdose, but um, but people who use opioids are often using other substances like alcohol, benzodiazepines, stimulants. And uh, so when somebody dies of an opioid overdose, they often have more than one substance on board. But but even in the recent years, we've noticed that um, that uh, drugs like methamphetamine, in particular methamphetamine, has also been contributing to overdoses, both when combined with opioids and then also separately. Um, and, you know, I, I think um, we're hearing more and more, really at the case report and case series level, not not really in a, uh, a, a quantifiable manner, but the, the way that fentanyl has been introduced into other uh, illicit drugs um, and contaminating them. And so um, while I think for the most part, what, what we're seeing is opioids, well, fentanyl sold as opioids, which is more potent and more erratic, more dangerous than expected. We're also seeing fentanyl sold as cocaine, fentanyl sold as methamphetamine, fentanyl sold as counterfeit pills that aren't opioids like benzodiazepines or even uh, stimulants. And so that's kind of part of this new wave. I think another part of the new wave is what you're hearing about more and more in the news of xylazine, or, or, which is a contaminant um, that's usually um, used in combination with an opioid to extend the life of the, of the feeling of the opioid. And that can result in some, some nasty complications um, that uh, have been prominent in the news recently, but um, experienced for a while in places like Philadelphia and Puerto Rico. I think you're raising a really important point here that right now, it's not just individuals who are using opioids, right? It's individuals who are using any substance that's, you know, probably non-prescribed and that people can obtain and purchase off the street is at risk of being contaminated. So even patients, you know, who really predominantly may have a stimulant use disorder, right, and, and aren't necessarily seeking fentanyl or opioids, they're still at risk of having an overdose. So it's really important to have these conversations with all of our patients, you know, who are using non-prescribed substances, even intermittently, whether they have or don't have, you know, a use disorder. Yeah, that's right. One of the, there's a couple of populations I'm particularly concerned about where we're getting new news, which is, um, well, the good news for adolescents, I have teenage sons, as I mentioned, or now they're coming out of their teenage years. So think about uh, adolescents, young adults, uh, more as a parent, um, uh, sometimes as a provider, uh, it, although I'll, I'll say that young people typically present to addiction treatment a little bit later. So they, you know, the natural history of substance use and developing addictions is for people, uh, to, for adolescents to experiment, get exposed, um, and then uh, really develop use disorders in their late teens, early 20s, mid 20s. Um, and so, uh, the good news is is that in na national um, surveys like Monitoring the Future and the National Survey on Drug Use and Health, we're actually seeing decreases among the use of uh, illicit substances like uh, heroin, um, cocaine, methamphetamine, a young, young people. I don't think that's really widely understood or known that we're actually seeing improved um, uh, numbers of people using those substances. On the other hand, we're seeing, especially in the last two or three years, dramatic increases in the number of overdose deaths among that age group. And so what that means to me is the good news is the pool of people using is not getting bigger. It's actually maybe getting smaller. But the dangerousness of the drugs that people are using is really increasing. And um, and so that means that um, you know this overdose prevention um, is probably important not just for people who have a use disorder who are in their mid twenties and later, but people who are experimenting with drugs in in their younger years. 
Um, and so uh, that's that's one thing. The other thing I think is really important to point out is that in states like Massachusetts, where we've had high overdoses for a long time, in white populations, overdoses are stable or going down, whereas in black Latinx and especially um, American Indian Native American populations, we've seen uh, surges uh, really since 2019. And I think that's uh, important because this is what often happens over and over again when we look at disparities and equities in our health system. It's um, communities that are left out or excluded or have historically been oppressed that um, bear the brunt or the heart of part of the epidemiology. And so uh, the implications for that, of course, are that just like with young people, we have to think different, ta tailor what we know works so that it meets those uh, young people where they're at. We also have to do that for, um, uh, for minoritized people who, um, you know, have been cut out of health care and cut out of harm reduction. So, and in some ways, this should be a case that's instead an adolescent, you know, from one of those communities that um, is, you know, occasionally tries pills from somewhere. Um, so, if you're talking to a patient, especially maybe one who isn't someone who uses opioids regularly and hasn't responded to opioid overdoses, um, what are the signs and symptoms of an opioid overdose? Um, and has that, what that looks like, changed at all as the drug supply has changed in terms of fentanyl or xylazine? Has, has, has that changed at all how you think of what an overdose might look like? Well, the cardinal feature of an opioid overdose is respiratory depression and loss of consciousness. So uh, t sometimes respiratory depression becomes respiratory arrest, and that's when, you know, the overdose is progressing and person's really at high risk of dying. Um, and along with that respiratory depression comes uh, signs of hypoxia. So, um, you know, blue nail beds, blue lips, um, and uh, reduced re re reduce breathing, re reduced level of consciousness. So that's um, that in proximity to opioid use, or I would say drug use, um, makes your biggest concern, an opioid overdose. Uh, and so that respiratory depression is really what the focus should be um, when in responding. I've had some of my patients too, in particular, have sort of described and been around from that transition from heroin to fentanyl, where they're describing that with the change in supply to fentanyl, that there's even less time almost to respond to an overdose. Yes. Yeah. So you, you you ask sort of what's changed, right? And so that's really the way I think about the, the sort of, this is a pearl, I guess. So um, for oxycodone, heroin, other uh, full agonist opioids, um, an overdose evolves over minutes to hours. So there's time to intervene. Whereas with fentanyl, the overdose evolves over seconds to minutes. There's many stories. Like, so classically, you know, when I, first started working on overdose and teaching about it, we uh, tried to disabuse people of this um, view that often is portrayed in, in media where uh, somebody dies from a heroin overdose with a needle in their arm. That's not really the case in most heroin overdoses, but with a fentanyl overdose, that definitely happens. Um, so the fentanyl overdose death can evolve in, you know, four minutes, basically, um, because uh, people can immediately stop breathing. And um, that can be really tragic. Uh, we, I mean, I, the many stories of um, people who are dying in the bathroom when their social network, their loved ones, their friends, their family are outside uh, the room in the same house. Um, and, you know, they just go check on them after 10 minutes and then, oh, that's too late. Um, the, uh, at, at, yes. So, uh, you know, another example of that is when, uh, and this gets into some of the overdose prevention messages. Um, but, uh, we've evolved from telling people not just don't use alone, make sure someone is there with you to when you use, make sure that you take turns. 
So it's common practice for people who are using drugs together to use at the same time. And I have admitted um, a number of people to the methadone clinic where I'm taking their history about their overdose experience. And, um, you know, they, they told me that, yes, I, I used with my partner. Uh, we both uh, went to sleep and I woke up and they didn't. And uh, that's really, really traumatizing and tragic and horrible. And that didn't happen with heroin. I mean, just didn't happen. I never heard a story um, like that, um, but I've heard mul- before fentanyl. And now I hear multiple stories like that. So it, it the principles are still the same when it comes to how what an overdose looks like and how it evolves. But we do really need to update our overdose prevention and management messages. Um, and um, yeah, I mean, there, there's... With the with the, this fourth wave where we have other drugs more commonly involved, overdoses can start to look different. So w- one other difference with fentanyl, uh, that it doesn't happen the majority of the time, but there's this um, uh, frozen chest syndrome, which I don't think we fully understood where, but, but anesthesiologists who administer fentanyl in the operating room have known about this for a long time. It's a peculiarity with fentanyl where if they administer the fentanyl too fast, too much, there's a, a, essentially a, a lockup of the upper upper airways and of the chest goes rigid. And that can be very scary. We're not sure, or at least I'm not sure how deadly that is, but it's very frightening for people who are witnessing overdose. And then it, it does make it hard to do things like rescue breathing. Um, so, so anyway, those are some of the changes, uh, how fentanyl uh, overdose is different. Uh, but at the end of the day, it's respiratory depression, loss of consciousness from an oversaturation of opioid receptors, and it needs to be um, addressed through improving the resp- respiratory rate, um, which can include administering naloxone to dislodge or outcompete the fentanyl at the opioid receptor um, and uh, and doing some sort of ventilation, uh, ventil- ventilatory support. Um, so as you said, naloxone, it's an opioid antagonist. So it's a reversal agent. What are the different ways that individuals can actually administer naloxone? Well, the most common now is intranasal with a nasal spray. And there's a number of products that are available. And the first naloxone formulation that is over the counter, there was an announcement, I think, at the end of March from the FDA that there is a intranasal naloxone nasal spray that has been approved. I think that we're going to see multiple products approved. That's important because then hopefully there'll be some more market competition, which will drive the price down. Um, And so, so that's, that's sort of, that's, and that's what we most commonly see used in Massachusetts. Uh, One of the things about most nasal naloxone delivery formulations is you deliver a fixed dose. It's one squirt and you get four milligrams, uh, which is uh, pretty bioavailable. And and that, uh, in some cases, uh, can cause precipitated withdrawal. Um, And um, so that's uh, that's. Well, one thing about nasal, the more commonly used historically is injectable naloxone. Intramuscular usually could also be injected intravenously or subcutaneously, but m- most commonly intramuscularly with a needle and syringe uh, where it's pulled up out of the vial. And in most, in, that's the most commonly used in harm reduction programs, community harm reduction programs in the U.S. And the reason for that is that it's cheaper. That's been more readily available at a lower cost to community harm reduction programs. And one, I just will mention one website that um, is the Remedy Alliance for the People is a nationwide supplier to harm reduction programs um, that provides uh, the best price uh, for naloxone. Um, it can be administered through an ET tube. There was at one point a automated intramuscular injector that talked to you, which um, was very expensive. Uh, Depending on who was paying for it, it would range between $300 and, I don't know, $4,000 for an auto injector. Um, But that we're not seeing that available much, uh, much more uh, anymore. So, but 
you, somebody may run across it at some point. So you mentioned that one of the challenges of the intranasal formulation is the fixed dose that is sometimes high enough to make people very uncomfortable and that harm reduction programs often have the intramuscular and maybe some more flexibility. So can you tell us a little bit more about how like the doses that work, um, how often can you give it? And we've he- I've heard about the idea of people needing naloxone many times or higher, do- or we should have higher dose formulation. So it seems like there's a lot of discussion about how much naloxone is the correct amount of naloxone. Yeah, there is a lot of discussion about it. And um, I'm not sure we really have uh, the best evidence to make the right decision. I think there's a lot of marketing of high dose naloxone products without uh, very clear evidence and a lot of disregard for the harm that can be caused by precipitating withdrawal. Having that precipitated withdrawal experience is not pleasant. It definitely doesn't uh, lead to less uh, return to use. Um, but what it can do is estrange people from the healthcare system and, and make them more averse to getting naloxone. So um, we really want to focus on not waking the person up completely, but getting their respiratory rate and their oxygenation going. And the really seasoned paramedics and EMS um, that are responding to overdoses, that's what they do. They um, they titrate the naloxone so that the person's breathing but not sick. Um, and I think that's also what the seasoned community folks do, do who've rescued a lot of people. Now, that's easier said than done, and it's always better to get naloxone than not get it if there's a question of the person dying. Um, but but what we really want to focus on is is getting people breathing again enough so that they can oxygenate. And you know, I mentioned xylazine, I mentioned benzodiazepines. There's also a lot of co-use with other sedatives like gabapentin or clonidine. And the result of using those other sedating or alcohol for that matter is that you can get the respiratory rate back, but it's going to take time for those other sedating medications to wear off or drugs to wear off. And so it may take time to get full level of consciousness back. And that is okay. Uh, the person needs to be taken care of, and but um, if if you just keep administering naloxone until they wake up completely, you're most likely going to put that person into withdrawal. Um, and so we do get reports of stacking doses, so people getting four doses of four milligrams or six doses of four milligrams, you know, one after the other after the other. And I don't think, I don't think. Doses after the third, after the second dose, really are are making that big of a difference. What well, what you need to do is is ventilate those folks while you wait for the naloxone to work. And classically, the way we want people to ventilate people is through mouth to mouth or rescue breathing in the community. Of course, with COVID, I've thought a lot more about that because um, you know it's asking a lot for somebody a rescuer to to do mouth to mouth resuscitation and so um what i what i counsel people now is that um people should um ventilate the person in the way that they were trained um if they were doing CPR and so i do think that their first an option is actually to do chest compressions um for somebody who's not breathing sufficiently as a way to ventilate um now, we don't have a lot of evidence. This is, uh, uh, you told me I should uh, expert uh, opinion. disclaim. That's expert opinion, right. And I'm not the only one. There are, there, there are some or organizations that, um, that support that. But, um, and, you know, and, and, and if you're in a situation like a health clinic where, or a public bathroom um, or a harm reduction program where there are multiple overdoses, at that point, I think it's important for staff to get trained and be equipped with an AMBU bag or a bag valve mask. And that's what we do in Massachusetts. So for the folks who are rescuing people, I think it is important. And I carry, um, I carry a face mask around with me um, so that if I need to do rescue breathing, I can do it with a mask and, you know, um, it delivers the breathing more efficiently and, um, 
and uh, it provides a little more protection for me. So one, I should say, if you're a bystander and you have the intranasal naloxone and someone's unresponsive, don't hesitate to give it, right? Don't think twice, like give it. It's not going to hurt anybody. It's safe to use. And if you're lucky enough, you know, to be in a setting where you have additional medical support, you have additional training, it's not unreasonable to just give smaller doses of naloxone at the start, see how they do, and sort of titrate really to their respiratory rate. Yeah, that's right. You you know, if you're a bystander and you're by yourself, like in the case of Jay, Jay called for help, right? So what we know Jay did was Jay administered naloxone and called for help. And then EMS came and rescued his roommate, right? Um, what Jay could have done while uh, he was waiting for EMS to come is to rescue breathe. Um, how long do you wait until you give that second dose? Three minutes, which seems like a very long time when you're in the midst of responding, but we really, I think it does make sense to wait that three minutes. And almost every naloxone kit that I'm aware of is includes two doses. And so you get the first dose, you support their breathing as best you can, call for help. And then if there's no response or no improvement, give that second dose. If the person starts breathing but doesn't wake up completely, you stay with them, you wait for help to arrive, you make sure they're breathing, that their color is coming back, um, they're oxygenated, and and then, you know, let the EMS take care of them. So what is your patient spiel? How would you counsel Jay on, you know, dealing with this aftermath and what he could have done or how he responded and also how he could prevent his own overdose on his own part in the future? So... I would start if Jay was in my office saying, you know, let's, how did, you know, how do you feel about it? And not assume that he feels great about it and not assume that he feels terrible about it because it could be either way. Um, I have many patients who are very proud of their role they've played in, in saving their loved ones or their roommates. Um, but then I have others who, you know, it, it was super scary and traumatic and they don't want to go through it again. And so like any uh, primary care visit, it's important to really understand where your patient's at. So once I figure that out, I want to turn my attention to Jay. And this is kind of the screening that I do with all of my patients. I start by just saying, how do you protect yourself against overdose? And a lot of my patients are, are, are seeking or have been in treatment. And so their immediate answer is, well, it's not an issue for me because I'm in treatment. And so I will say that is a fantastic plan A, and I really applaud you for it, but I need to hear what your plan B is. Um, what happens if you wake up one day and you decide not to take your treatment or that you're not going to do treatment and you're going to use? What's your plan then? And so the things I'm looking for in an answer um, and I want to hear it from them because if they tell me, then I don't need to tell them. Uh, but if it is, you know, I, if I'm going to use to keep myself safe, I'm going to use with someone else who's there. I'm going to try not to mix drugs. Um, I'm going to start low and go slow. Um, if I'm with someone else, I'm going to take turns like we talked about before. And we're going to have naloxone present and we're going to have a cell phone that works so that we can call if there's help. So that's the overdose protection plan for somebody who is going to use. And I find I have to push my patients to get to that point, really to think it through. But that's what I want to hear from them and counsel them. on. Now, um, there's also the issue of people on prescription opioid medications. If I had or any sort of sedating medications, I ask them, how do you keep your medication safe at home? And that's anybody, whether they have a use disorder or not. And it tells them that, A, I understand they have medications, and B, um, they need to lock them up. Um, and really, that's kind of true for people who use drugs. They should be keeping their drugs safe when they're not using them by keeping them out of other people's hands. So then I turn not to, you know, what is their own risk, but then their, their ability to be around other people 
who are who are using. And so I asked, what is your plan if you witness an overdose in the future? And in Jay's case, I'd be interested to hear what he has to say because he just rescued his friend. And, um, you know, I probably talked to him about how administering naloxone is a, a good thing. Um, and, uh, you know, talk to him about what his thoughts are about doing rescue breathing or some sort of ventilation um, and uh, and calling for help. And then I asked, uh, have you received training to prevent, recognize, or respond to an overdose? If they have, then, you know, and I ask them to tell me what that training is so I can verify it's a teach back type of uh, situation. So it sounds like the main ways you approach it is you, to sum up, you try to open ask open-ended questions, make sure you're hearing from their experiences and kind of getting a sense of what, 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 if any, holes they might have in knowledge and especially focus on the going slow, the taking turns using and not using alone and the um, having naloxone available and for the response part, the rescue breathing and kind of the, the naloxone is great, but there's like making sure that they, they know all the pieces of like rescue breathing and calling for help. Um, does that pretty much sum it up? Yeah, that's right. I mean, the, the sort of the thing that is just uh, not debatable with in the case of fentanyl is it's never safe to use fentanyl unless you're observed by somebody who's present with naloxone and ready to call for help. This is basically a, a case for why we need um, drug consumption spaces or supervised consumption rooms. Um, now, that's another interesting thing with the pandemic, right, is that uh, it's mixed messaging. We want people to be together, but there was a period there where we really wanted people to to not be around each other. And so, and, and so I just gave this, it should never happen, but it's going to happen. People are going to use alone because it's a highly stigmatized, um, highly stigmatized behavior, basically, right? It's criminalized. Um, pe people don't want their family or their friends to know. So they're going to use alone. And so in those cases, we need to really try other things, um, which, you know, again, this is expert opinion and not, uh, evidence-based yet, but this is where we get into ideas around virtual spotting. Now, what virtual spotting is, is where you, if I'm going to use, I'm going to call somebody on the phone um, and have them um, know where I am and uh, make sure that I'm safe uh, while I use. And um, and then if, if I don't become unresponsive, they're going to call for help and have somebody sent to where I am to respond. Um, and there's a number of different efforts that have been done to, to do that. So that's that's kind of, I don't know, uh, a little advanced, but it's where we need to be because more and more people are dying from overdose. Most of the people who are dying are dying at home alone. Um, and, you know, there are some people who are dying at home with someone else in the other room. But, uh, you know, so so we need to we need to really do things to address the stigma uh, where people isolate. And I've had patients tell me too, if they if they are in a situation where they do have somebody with them, that they're worried, that they're scared to call nine one one, right? That maybe they are on prob probation or parole, and they're worried, like, what's going to happen to me? Am I going to have to have additional legal charges? Like, I, there's going to be drug paraphernalia. Um, I hear this all the time from patients. I've even had patients say, you know, my I watched my friend overdose. I called 911, told them where they were, and then I ran out the back door as soon as I heard the sirens, you know, because they were so worried about this. Um, I know a lot of states have different, you know, Good Samaritan laws that kind of vary in nature. Um, I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit more about these um, and maybe where people can find more information about those laws in their own state. Yeah, so uh, there's a... There are many states have Good Samaritan laws, which um, provide some protection and instruction to law enforcement not to arrest or prosecute people who overdose or people who respond to an overdose. And so uh, those can provide some comfort. Um, none of them uh, protect people from uh, parole violations, probation violations, or warrant checking. And... Um, so, but law enforcement tends to use their discretion in those settings. At the end of the day, these Good Samaritan laws are helpful. They are symbols. But it, but what really matters is 
um, the relationship between law enforcement and people who use drugs and their attitudes towards people who use drugs. Um, the uh, and and so in some communities the um, the relationship's quite hostile, and in other communities it's not. Um, the police really see themselves as as more of public health um, supporters and part of the solution. Um, and um, and so I I hesitate to make any blanket statements around the Good Samaritan issue, but rather to encourage people to educate themselves of what's the status in their local community, not just of exactly what the laws are, but what the relationship is between law enforcement and emergency response. Uh, there is one resource, which I think is really good. Uh, it's a public health law website. Um, and it, it goes, I actually don't know what the acronym stands for, but it's PDAPS.org. And that can give you the most recent naloxone uh, access laws, like whether it's available in the pharmacy or, um, uh, but also the Good Samaritan laws. We've been focusing a lot of our conversation on opioid overdoses in the community, but I want to just switch gears a little bit and talk about responding to opioid overdoses in the hospital, which is something we, you know, we probably have done, whether we're on addiction consult service or whether we're a generalist on wards. So let's see, like what common pitfalls do you see clinicians making when they're responding to a possible opioid overdose in the hospital? Well, I alluded to this earlier. I think it happens in the community also. Um, but what you have in the hospital, which you don't have in the community, is the ability to monitor people's vital signs and, and really figure out where the so-called lesion is uh, in their vital signs. So, um, uh, you know, we I, I don't know how much you want to get into hospital policies around drug use, um, but... Uh, uh, Suffice it to say, no matter what your policy is in your hospital, people are going to use drugs in your hospital if, as long as you're taking care of people who use drugs. Um, and that's definitely the case for opioids. People are going to be in withdrawal in the hospital. They're going to have cravings. The hospital is not a comfortable place. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, most people who have a serious opioid use disorder have experienced a lot of trauma and a lot of discomfort. Um, in their lives, even outside of the withdrawal that they're feeling, and then they're going to have withdrawal on top of that, be in a new situation, et cetera. So people are going to use in the hospital. So um, so it's good to have on your differential diagnosis. If you come across a patient who's somnolent or over-sedated or who's not breathing um, or who codes, you should think about opioid overdose. Now, um, I think a common pitfall is that we equate overdose response with naloxone, and we just administer naloxone right away. And especially in the hospital, you can measure their oxygen saturation, their respiratory rate, their blood pressure, their pulse. And if the lesion is just they're over-sedated, but they're oxygenating well, um, then, uh, you know, step up the nursing care, monitor them, uh, and uh, wait for them to get better because um, it'll wear off. And it may not even be an opioid in that case. It might be a benzodiazepine. And if it's a benzodiazepine, they're going to be sedated. And any opioid that is on board, you're going to neutralize. So, yes, they'll start breathing, but they're going to be, uh, you know, groggy and in withdrawal. And then how do you treat that? I mean, that that's difficult, right? The way to treat that is probably to give them another opioid. But now you're giving an opioid on a in a drowsy patient who's also on a benzo. So, you know, just let it, let nature take its course, make sure their vital signs are okay and um, let them ease out of it. You know, if, if their oxygenation is low, the first thing to do, I think, is to give them oxygen um, and try to get the oxygen level up. Um, and, uh, and, you know, and then if you, if you feel like, uh, um, that's not enough, then give them a small dose of naloxone, a test dose, uh, uh, while you're monitoring them and see if that can improve their respiratory rate. Um, so anyway, those are the approaches that it take. You can, you're going to have um, uh, intravenous naloxone in the hospital. Um, you can dilute that in a 10 cc saline syringe and then just give, you know, um, uh, you can get 0.04 milligrams instead of a full 0.4 amp 
of naloxone, um, or you can give 0.08 and just see what happens. Um, uh, again, uh, this is a serious issue, so uh, it may be a pain to increase their level of care. They, you know, if they have to go to the step down unit or to the ICU, but uh, it's life threatening. And and what you're likely to do if you slam them with naloxone is they're going to go into withdrawal and they're going to leave. And when they leave, they're more likely to, you know, they're more likely to use, not to mention whatever thing you were treating them for, if it was a serious soft tissue infection or a pneumonia or renal failure, that's going to get worse. And they're just going to go back in the emergency department and it's going to be more complicated. I think that's a great point. It's get back to your ABCs, you know, airway, breathing, circulation, because in a rapid response scenario too, I think sometimes our patients are at risk of being labeled, mislabeled, right? And there's actually something else going on, right? And we're at risk of missing it if we're just like, oh, this is this is an overdose um, or say a patient's on methadone and, and they're stable on methadone, right? And you give them some naloxone and they wake up. Well, of, of course they are going to because you've just essentially put them into precipitated withdrawal, you know, depending on the dose. Well, I was just going to say another situation that comes up a lot more and more is that, uh, and it happens in the emergency department, is somebody comes into the emergency department after they've been given lots of naloxone in the field. And so they are in withdrawal. They're very sick. And so what do you do in that that circumstance? And in that case, I think we need to not be afraid to give them a full agonist. And what full agonist do you give them? Well, whichever one works. Um and so, you know, it, it could be a short acting, probably at first, give them a short acting opioid so you get them comfortable and then start having a discussion about whether they want to be started on a on treatment, figuring out whether they're going to be admitted or not, and then making a plan from there. You could also give them methadone. In some cases, if they really want it and are asking for it, I think you could give them buprenorphine. You know, if they want, so let's say they, they've been on buprenorphine before and they're asking for it. The people come in the emergency department, they're not asking for that much naloxone. They're very sick. All their brain is telling them at that moment when they have that withdrawal is, I need an opioid. And so the only way you're going to get that person to focus on their health is to give them an opioid. And there's nothing dangerous about that, especially if they're in an emergency department. They give them give it to them all the time. You have the vital signs you can monitor. Um, and, and what you're going to do is buy yourself some time so you can have a, 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 a good conversation with the person, triage their medical care, and then come up with a, a harm reduction and, and substance use care plan. I think that's such a great point. And I think the kind of unifying thought of this hospital discussion is it's a monitor situation. We need to be thinking about if people are oxygenating, that they're okay, that we have time, we have options, and we need to be mindful of what's going to happen next. Like we need to be thinking about the big picture and what's going to keep this person safe in the next few hours and days. Um, I think practically for me, it's sometimes tough because there's an order set with naloxone 0.4, you know, like that's what's in the order set. There's one response and there's this assumption. And I think part of it comes from stigma of, well, this person's sedated and they must have used and therefore they deserve naloxone. And part of it comes from just a response, an assumption that this is the default response. We have one thing to give them and that's what we're going to give them. Do you have ideas of strategies of how to how do we change this in hospitals? Is it person by person education? Is it department by department? Is it order sets? How do you change the um, especially the overdose response in the hospital kind of scenario? Well, I think there's a role for multidisciplinary care. So, um, you know, um, I, I'm an internist. I have a lot of thoughts about what should happen in the emergency department. Those never happen unless I work or collaborate or I'm led by somebody who works in the emergency department, not always a physician, could be a nurse, uh, a pharmacist or a social worker. Um, and the same is true in the inpatient setting. I mean, you know, in the inpatient setting, you, you really can't get much done unless you have buy-in from nurses. That, uh, in, in at least the settings I've worked in, they are the ones who are the most patient-centered. And um, if you're going to make the hospital more um, substance use patient centered, I think the nurses are key. And um, 
And a lot of the, you know, who who's come up with the, you know, the, all of the most innovative harm reduction um, innovations? Well, it's people who use drugs themselves. So that and that's the case in the community. But as far as evolving care in medical settings, it's typically nurses, I think, who have to take um, the lead in transforming the care setting. Um, and so as physicians, we need to figure out how to partner with them. Um, they're the ones who are really on the front lines. The same is true with the, the medical assistants um, and, um, you know, and the techs and um, the disposition uh, team. But uh, so how do you do that? Well, you make friends and um, you try to find out who the champions and the leaders are and uh, you talk it through with them. That's a great point. So much of what we do relies on interprofessional care. It's important to like build those relationships. And also, I think it goes a long way towards battling the stigma, right, that our patients face overall. I do want to add like one point to, you know, there are, it's great to have options. And also there are probably some scenarios where you, you want to give like a higher dose right away if somebody is desatting, they're coding, you know. So while we've had this great discussion about titration, use your clinical judgment. That's what we kind of want to say. Like use your vitals and let that help gu guide you in terms of where we want to start and how stable the patient is in front of you. Going back to Jay, to, as we're wrapping up, um, you mentioned there's this um, recent naloxone might become available. We also know that there's been equity, probably equity issues already with naloxone and this question of how much it's going to cost. So um, what do you think the future is going to hold? Any insight into when naloxone might be available and if it's going to, will it be affordable? Will it make um, equity issues better or worse? What do you think it's going to look like? What the future brings as far as the timeline? I, I think that uh, over-the-counter naloxone is going to come and it will be here to stay. And I think we're going to see um, more choices and more formulations. Hopefully with that competition, there'll be lower and lower prices um, so that, it, you know, uh, people are willing uh, to buy it at the pharmacy. Um, most naloxone going to the people who really need it are probably going to go out through community-based public health funded programs. And so um, I think making it over the counter is probably going to make it easier for those community-based programs to get naloxone and then distribute it to the people who are really need it, like people who use drugs and their friends and family. Uh, and I think um, there's going to be probably a continued um, evolution of um, new formulations of naloxone. Um, I, I'm skeptical of higher doses of naloxone as being the answer. I think actually maybe more titratable naloxone is, uh, something I would like to see. Um, and, uh, you know, just in many states, I mentioned that PDAPS.org website in many states, naloxone is already available behind the counter without a prescription in the pharmacy. Uh, and so, you know, it, it uh, if you're in Massachusetts, it's available in every single pharmacy by law. Um, and most, almost all insurance plans actually cover it. So uh, you get it for the cost of your copay. Um, and so that's true in not all, but other states. Uh, and so, uh, you know, that's another way to get it. And um, you don't have to wait necessarily for over the counter naloxone to come to your local pharmacy. And if people are looking for things to advocate for in their medical societies, those are the kinds of things that, you know, are sometimes the, that are things to uh, consider. Speaking of that, um, <laughs> it, at, uh, I'm at Boston Medical Center, um, and we're the hospital for Boston University School of Medicine. Uh, the hospital's employee insurance plan covered naloxone um, for bystanders as a part of the health plan, but the medical school didn't in their insurance plan. And so the medical students advocated for it with their dean to have it included in their in their health plan. And so that type of advocacy is is really important and is particularly potent coming from from healthcare providers. So I'm glad you brought that up as a way to advocate. 
that warms my heart to hear that medical students are already thoughtful and making real changes that matter. I, I mean, um, this whole, I, I talked about addiction medicine and how I think it's a wonderful field. Um, it, you know, um, we talk about ourselves as being stigmatized field because our patients are stigmatized. Um, but it's also warms my heart that more and more trainees are interested in getting into the field. It's extremely rewarding. Um, and we have tools that really work. Um, and we don't do it alone. Um, uh, we, we work in teams, uh, and not just with physicians, but to be successful, you have to work with, as I mentioned earlier, nurses, um, social workers, uh, more and more we're working with people with lived in living experience. Uh, I think there's a better appreciation of the power of, uh, of, uh, really the concept of nothing about us without us, um, is one of the ways that we're really going to be able to, I think, engage people who have for a long time been shut out of the system. So, um, yeah. Uh, and there's lots of levels of advocacy, right? From that, what you do for yourself, your individual patient, um, and then every level that you confront the system. This has been a great conversation. I've learned a ton today. And do you have any main take-home points for our listeners? I'd start with number one, think about uh, the respiratory rate, like if you're in overdose response, that's what really matters. Um, are they oxygenated? And focus more on that than whether they're alert and oriented times three. Um, that's number one. Um, number two is the drug supply is erratic and extremely dangerous. Um, and that's largely driven by fentanyl, but we don't know what is going to drive it six months from now. So um, staying tuned in um, to what people are facing is important. And, um, and you know, I think this is a field where we need innovation and we need more tools. Um, and then, you know, lastly, we talked about the hospital um, and, uh, you know, trying to make the hospital a more welcoming place for the people who really need it when they need it, which uh, unfortunately is uh, many times people who use drugs and face life-threatening complications from their substance use or from their, um, or from being excluded from, you know, other parts of care um, as outpatients. So um, yeah, that, those would be my three take-homes. Yeah. I'll add one more in just, just for, just for fun. Uh, don't forget to co-prescribe naloxone to people who use stimulants, benzodiazepines, because as you said, the, Supply right now is extraordinarily toxic. Fentanyl is contaminated into everything. So make sure that those folks are also getting naloxone in their hands. Great tip. Um, do you have anything you want to plug? It can be anything. It can be addiction-related or fun, fun-related. <laughs> well, you know, uh, I guess I'm. I'm. Uh, we're already plugging, or we're already partnering with the American College of Academic Addiction Medicine, which is uh, the organization that supports addiction medicine fellowships. So I really want to encourage people. We need we need you in this field, and it's rewarding, and uh, you can make a big difference, and you won't be doing it alone. So that's the first thing. Um, you know, as far as um, as far as Personally, I've had the opportunity this year to travel. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm doing a partial sabbatical, and so I've actually gotten to travel to some other countries. And um, when you travel, make sure you travel uh, and, and see friends. Um, take time for yourself. But also uh, think about how things work or don't work in other places. I, I've learned a lot from seeing um, how uh, other countries try to address the same issues that we're facing here. And um, no place is perfect or has all the answers, but there are ideas that people, um, you know, are, are, are working on in other places that I think we can learn a lot from. Uh, so I don't know. That's my other, if you're asking for tips. That's great. Thank you so much for joining us. It's been so nice to have you on and to learn more about overdose prevention response. And it's been great to have you. Well, uh, I'm a big fan um, and uh, uh, yeah, I'm really grateful that you guys are covering this topic. 
This has been another episode of our Curbsiders miniseries, The Curbsiders Addiction Medicine. Be sure to get your show notes at thecurbsiders.com slash addiction. We're committed to providing you with high value practice changing knowledge. And to do that, we need your feedback. So please subscribe, rate, and review the show on Apple Podcasts or contact us at curbsidersaddictionmed at gmail.com. A very special thanks to Dr. Matt Watto and Dr. Paul Williams for their support in this project, as well as ACAM, the American College of Academic Addiction Medicine. Learn more about the organization at ACAM.org. A special thanks to editor for this episode, Dr. Sarah Lighty, and to our whole team. The Curbsiders is produced and edited by the team at Podpaste. A reminder that this and most of our episodes are available for free CME credit for all healthcare professionals at curbsiders.vcuhealth.org. All you have to do is make an account. Until next time, I've been Dr. Carolyn Chan. I'm Dr. Natalie Stahl. Thanks for joining us today and letting us bring you some addiction medicine pearls. 